Well, hello, and uh, thanks so much for wanting to dig uh, into God's Word and this topic a little more by watching this uh, supplemental video wherever and whenever you're watching it. Uh, if you haven't watched yet the full message on uh, headship and submission in Ephesians 5, what do they mean, uh, then ideally watch that first in the link uh, on this video's description. And we tried, you know, in that message to really stick with the Ephesians text, but we know this topic in general brings up a lot of questions that maybe weren't answered in our message or require some further explanation. So, of course, this video cannot be an exhaustive or in-depth study or treatment of these subjects, but it's simply to add to what we've already said about Ephesians 5 and answer some more practical or pastoral questions about how that gets lived out. And it's our privilege to help continue the conversation and even the thinking about what it looks like to serve the Lord in this way. So one of these more pastoral situations that comes up is, what do I do if my husband continually insists that I submit to him? So just to be clear, there actually is no verse in the Bible that says that a man has authority over his wife. Here is the only verse that talks about authority in marriage. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. And heads up, it's actually about sex in marriage. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields, submits it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields and submits it to his wife. So wives, you have authority over your husbands, and husbands, you have authority over your wives. That's part of what it means to be one flesh. Almost every gender command in the Bible is like this, applying to both and encouraging mutuality and reciprocity in the marriage and male-female relationships. Does it make sense that Paul would say that in sex you are supposed to have a completely egalitarian and equal marriage, submitting to one another, but outside the bedroom, it's a totally different story. No, the general marital dynamics, whether parenting or careers or finances or education, are to model and reflect the beautiful oneness of the flesh and sharing and mutuality that takes place in that marital act. So it's why um, it's important to say, I think, it's a, a perversion of the Bible to emphasize that women need to be, you know, always sexually available to their husbands, as if that's the submissive biblical way, uh, which of course has led to, uh, sadly, all kinds of abuse, sexual violence, and very painful experiences for women. But that is actually not God's desire, and that is not what the Word of God says. So in this situation, or in many others, what if a man or a husband doesn't find the scripture applicable for some reason and keeps demanding submission and emphasizing his authority? What do I do? People might ask. And the real question, the real answer is, we know this is a hard situation. We recognize that it's challenging to be in this sort of dilemma and to be trying to follow God in your marriage, um, particularly if your husband doesn't understand or is emphasizing his authority. But really, a lot of it depends on the Lord's guidance to you in each situation through the Holy Spirit counsel, even through your friends and other wisdom like that. When you are making decisions, there might be times when you are called to say, you know what, I need to do this, despite whether my husband says this is what the right thing is or not. I, I need to do this. This concern, this passion, um, whatever is going on for other people is so important that I need to do this. And there may be other times where even if you feel like it's the right thing, even if you feel like the Lord has called you to do it and your husband is, is in opposition, there might be a place where it's, you're meant to wait. You're meant to submit that to the Lord and say, Lord, I feel like you're calling me to this and my husband doesn't agree. What do I do? So asking and waiting, maybe the Lord will provide another way. Um, we recognize that's really hard, but continue to follow the Lord in that. Yeah, so let's talk about other Bible passages 
that seem to say, you know, women should not teach or that men are the authority um, because, you know, you're probably thinking of some of these when, when we were preaching the previous message. And we'll spend most time on this because ultimately it's, it's the most important for anyone trying to live according to God's word who wants to. But I think it goes without saying, uh, we can't possibly cover all the details and explanations of other passages. We're just kind of scratching the surface here. But still, uh, let's look on a few ways to build on what we've already talked about in Ephesians 5. So let's start with the passage most similar to Ephesians in terms of man being called the head of the woman. And you might have been thinking of that passage during our Ephesians message, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and specifically verse 3, where Paul says, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God, and the implied is God the Father. And of course, the word for head here is again, uh, kephale or kephale. Now, Jesus is God, right? And is each person of the Trinity equally God? I hope your answer is yes, uh, or else we're into some serious uh, heresy here. Uh, We did a whole series on the Trinity right here at the church. And just to review, our definition was that the doctrine of the Trinity refers to the equal existence of the three persons of God, right? The three persons work in mutual submission to one another without being subordinate to one another. The Father is not superior to the Son or Spirit. The Spirit is not superior to the Son and so on. So when it says here that the head of Christ is God, it can't refer to superiority, authority, or any kind of hierarchy or leadership. It simply means that God, and again implied God the Father, is the source of life that flows through Christ, that the Father is in Christ and Christ is in the Father. And the same applies to woman and man. You know, man was the source of life to woman, so that woman is in man and man is in woman and they work together. A few verses down in 1 Corinthians 11, this gets fleshed out. So verses 11 and 12. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. This almost sounds like Dr. Seuss here, and it really confirms this balance between the sexes, that woman's not independent, man's not independent, women came from man, man is born of woman. So one cannot claim superiority or authority over the other. In fact, there's this reminder, everything comes from God, who is the authority. The first woman came from a man, but that doesn't give men any advantage or superiority because, after all, subsequently, all men were born of women. Yeah, so it's like, sort of a wash, right? Sort of a tie. It's like, you can't live without me, but I can't live without you because I was born of woman, uh, right? We're, we're, we're even, so to speak. But, you know, so we actually find Paul to be quite consistent in his egalitarian teaching here in 1 Corinthians 11. So what about the, the women must remain silent in church, in church passages uh, that uh, teach that they shouldn't, you know, assume th- authority over a man. So we're talking here about you know, 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 15, as well as uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, or 34 and 35. So there are several clues you know, that uh, clearly tell us that Paul, or the author, is, you know, A, speaking about some very specific situation in which his advice actually makes sense and is good advice, and then B, that these uh, were not meant to be timeless, eternal teachings. So Paul does advise in these passages that women shouldn't teach or speak in these specific churches or situations. However, you have to read that in light of the fact that elsewhere, Paul 100% assumes or even encourages women to pray and prophesy in public. Uh, He names a woman, Junia, as outstanding among the apostles in the early church. He praised 
his female co-laborers for the gospel in Romans 16, and he praised women who, who trained and schooled men in theology, you know, such as Luis and, and Eunice with Timothy or Priscilla, Priscilla with uh, Apollos, right? And there are many other examples in Scripture and even specifically with Paul. So Paul would be in great contradiction if, you know, the, the once-for-all teaching was women should never do this in any situation, so why does Paul teach this in these specific situations? Well, you know, part of it is we don't know all the situations in these churches and what Paul, what caused Paul to say this, uh, but we intuitively seem to understand that not everything he says here, you know, applies eternally for all time. So, for example, in the First Timothy 2 passage, the verse right before not permitting women to teach, Paul also says women should not wear elaborate hairstyles, or gold, or pearls, or expensive clothes. Uh, you know, so do we have checkers at our, our church doors looking for, you know, fancy hair, uh, gold earrings, pearl necklaces, or are we asking the price tags on the clothes before, you know, you can come into church? Of course not. We seem to have no problem understanding uh, that verse as a cultural thing, a specific situation. Well, the verses following that are no different, that, you know, you can't pick and choose which to follow and which not. So, if we wanted to take verse 12 literally in 1 Timothy 2, we'd have to also say, you know, women can't write books that men would read, uh, they can't teach in Christian schools with men in the class, and so on, right? And given the situation, as well as the culture at that time, honestly, this is probably good advice that Paul is giving in 1 Timothy. You know, we don't read this and say the Bible's just wrong here. No, I mean, consider that women were likely being disruptive, very disruptive, in how they were behaving, right? Interrupting, drawing attention to themselves, uh, kind of turning the church gathering into a fashion show. And you also have to consider that, you know, women in the, in the first century usually could not be educated, could not read, could not hold positions of leadership in the culture, and so it makes sense that Paul would give this advice, right? The principle or the, the takeaway here is that a church worship gathering can't just be a free-for-all for whoever feels like teaching, saying something, just anybody speaks up at any time if they feel like saying something, right? But the cultural situation here is, is no longer the same. We live in a society, thankfully, where women have equal opportunity as men, they are just as educated as men, and they can receive the same biblical training as men. But that was not the case in the first century. And women were also considered inferior by almost all in the first century. So it was a bad look for the church if visitors came uh, in and women were, you know, doing all of these things. But of course, you know, that is no longer the case. So I think we intuitively know and accept that many of these examples seem to be culturally relative and about a specific situation. Given that, there are so many ways to apply them in our culture. There are ways that we can transfer to our situation once we have understood what was happening there and why it was said. So of course, we should not prioritize our clothes in worship. Of course, we should not be disruptive. And you know, in that situation, another note is you often had grown men in, in that situation in that time married to teenagers. So it may have been extra disruptive or even extra maybe embarrassing for the church to see women um, exercising authority over their husbands in that church. So for us, that might look like, hey, while we want to follow Jesus and we want to do the crazy things he's called us to do, is there anything in our church that's unnecessarily weird or disruptive or would be very strange to someone who came in for the first time. Those are the kinds of things we don't want to dismiss these situations, but we want to apply them wisely to be aware of how things appear or how they might come off to outsiders. Yeah, so Paul's concerned, as he should be, with the credibility of the church, mm -hmm. of how things might appear to outsiders. But can you see how the exact opposite is true today? Right, that the thing that might cause outsiders to question the credibility of our message or gospel would be for them to only see men teaching or leading in church. Right, so in a fairly 
stunning irony, the gospel principle Paul is teaching in 1 Timothy 2 or 1 Corinthians 14 might actually lead us to hear the voice of women more in church rather than to silence the voice of women. Right? Paul's concerned about the witness and credibility of the church in those specific situations. And we naturally take this you know, same approach with, with so many other scriptures, right? Uh, you know, we understand that many texts are, are culturally conditioned or apply only to that time and maybe not to us in the same exact way. So, for example, do we still greet each other with a holy kiss as the Bible instructs us to? I mean, I can do that with Hannah. No? no? Okay. That would be appropriate. Uh, do we do that? No, that would be so weird, right, to the culture around us. I promise your church will have a 0% success rate in retaining visitors if you follow that scripture literally to greet each other with a holy kiss when you gather as the church. But does the principle apply mm -hmm. to show Christian love and affection towards each other and have a warm greeting? Well, of course, that applies and that we can learn. Yes, that's right. So here's we, where we want to land or end on this question. When the Bible is speaking as generally or as universally as possible, when it gives hints or glimpses of what would be the ideal situation, of when God's kingdom is flourishing or reaching its fullest potential, it's always a world of equality between men and women. Whether that's Genesis 1 and 2, before sin enters the world, where men, man and woman are co-rulers of creation and they share in the equal partnership and responsibility and authority of caring for God's world. Or in Acts 2, when the Spirit falls on both men and women and both are given gifts to lead. There is no distinction, as Galatians 3 says, between Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So when the Bible is painting a picture of this ideal, there's never hierarchy, always equality. So that's sort of where we want to end on that question, not that it's over. But let's continue to the next one. Here, let's go right into the marriage. Let's go right into the thick of it. And this is a question that we get asked frequently. If there is disagreement between the husband and the wife in a marriage that is trying to follow God and be egalitarian, who gets the final word on a decision? This doesn't apply to our marriage because actually we've never had a disagreement, but uh, we know it's happened to others. I think we're known for our bickering actually, so opposite. So we want to emphasize that if you're both believers, you should embrace that man and woman are created equal. One does not have an inherent say-so, as Jamin Hubner says over the other, or a more direct relationship to God than the other by virtue of their sex. And you might actually be surprised how little this situation comes up. So I feel like this has maybe come up like two or three times in our marriage where someone really had to be like, oh, who does get the final word here? If it does come up, here are some words of advice. First of all, waiting is always great. There are very few decisions that are huge and urgent. Sometimes they are, but usually they're not. So you can often wait until you come to some sort of agreement or compromise. Compromise is something that's great in marriage. Wait until the Lord helps one person let it go. You know, it might be like, after praying about it, I realize that this is, this is more important to you, and I think I'm just going to let this go. Um, be patient. Don't feel like, wow, this is where our, our power really comes to a head and someone has to have that final decision. Trust the Lord that he will actually help you come to this decision or give one person the grace to yield to the other and have a peace about it. Sometimes there's something that's clearly more important to one person than the other, and that can influence your decision. And sometimes it's about waiting um, or letting go to the other person. All right, so last question on this uh, mini tour here. Uh, what then does it mean for a man or woman to be a leader in the home? So, you know, through all of this, are we saying that it's wrong for the man to lead in the household? No, of course not. Right? But is it wrong for him to claim leadership without full agreement or consent? Yes, but that would be wrong. But a common situation we come across, which is you know, always a little bit sad, is a woman or wife who kind of desperately wants a, a strong Christian home or Christian leadership in her home, but you know, believes it's the husband who has to lead and be the head of the home. 
and therefore kind of quietly waits in, in frustration and even sadness uh, for her husband to, to rise up and be the spiritual leader, even though he's, he's not interested in doing so. Do you think that's what God wants or intends? Do you think God wants your children's discipleship to suffer so that you can be seen as not usurping leadership in your home? But hopefully this teaching gives, you know, wives and husbands full freedom to spiritually lead in their homes, realizing that both are called by God to lead. And it often looks different in different situations and seasons. And part of that freedom is realizing that there are those, those different seasons of leadership mm -hmm. in marriage. And, and we've seen this so much in our marriage over the years. So one thing that helps me think about what this submission means, actually two things. First of all, um, the word is sometimes even translated yield. So when we talk about this word submit, maybe yield is a better way to think about it. If that helps you think about how you're you're giving grace to the other person, or you're giving almost like a turn to the other person. So another way to think about it is to think about a roundabout. Um, you know, it's not a stop sign where you just stop and you wait, but it's you're waiting for them to go by, you're kind of giving them grace, and then you're going to go into the roundabout, right? So sometimes a marriage looks like that. That can often happen in seasons. You might find if you've been married a while, you've noticed there's different seasons in your marriage, and it is okay to kind of fluctuate in your leadership in different areas. That's not something that you should feel bad about, whether you're yielding to the other person or you're needing the other person to lead more in that area. So it might be one person, you know, in the season, they're doing a lot more of the encouragement. It might be one person in the season who's doing a lot more of the praying. That happens too. Maybe the household tasks or the leadership or the making of the money that might depend on one person more than another in different seasons. And that is okay. If your spouse is having a hard time, you shouldn't feel bad taking that leadership. And that takes the pressure off of them. And that's a gift to them. At the same time, if you're, you know, not doing well in a way or you know that your spouse is better at something than you are, then give them that gift of leadership. And that's a way that they can bless you as well. Yeah, and hopefully in a good way, that kind of takes the pressure off of men as well to feel like you always need to be strong. You always need to be taking the lead. You always need to be doing well, mm -hmm. right? It's okay if sometimes your wife is stronger and she's doing better mm -hmm. and she's in a better position to lead. God intends for husbands and wives to be co-leaders mm -hmm. of their families and households. So, you know, when God gives you the grace to lead, then lead. When God seems to be giving the grace to the other to lead, let them lead. In some situations, you might have a spouse who's not well physically or emotionally or mentally or maybe is not a believer. And we recognize, as we said earlier, that that can be really challenging as well. But we want to encourage you in your leadership in that way, not to bully the other person into coming closer to God or to being the person that you want them to be that you wish that they were right now, but to lean on the Holy Spirit and to take authority Take the authority of the Holy Spirit in your home um, as a blessing that the fruit of the Spirit would flow through you, that you could take authority over the enemy in your home and do those sorts of things that are a blessing to your spouse. And that's not something you have to wait for them. That's not something where you have to be disappointed and wish that they were this or that. The Lord has made you the leader so you can do that with his help. So thanks for listening. To, uh, this kind of extra teaching on this. We hope it's been helpful. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, um, you can use some of the contact links on the video below if you want recommendations or want to explore further. We have some more reso resources. Um, but uh, we're so thankful that uh, you've allowed us to talk about this with you. And again, continue to work out uh, what you believe in the worshiping community and uh, help each other out on this. So any final words from you? Men, please lead. Please lead in your workplaces and lead in your families and lead in the church. And women, please lead. Please lead in the workplace and lead in your families and lead in the church. And do that by following Jesus' example of leadership to de deny ourselves and pick up our cross and with the strength of the Holy Spirit to follow him and to bless others. Amen.